Hello, hello! My name is Sofia and this is an audio version of my blog entry entitled How to do a small OSINT investigation. Introduction. With an overall increase in people's interest in OSINT, either as a tool to fight disinformation, part of the reconnaissance phase of ethical hacking, or as an aid in the investigation of possible war crimes, we have come to witness a surge in videos, articles, podcasts, etc. on the topic. For most of it, the focus tends to be the tools needed to get the job done. But the job is not done with the tools, it's done with your brain. The tools are just there to help you gather the open source data that you'll still need to verify, analyze and later on turn into intelligence. This can be in the style of a report, an article, a book or any other form of wider dissemination of your findings. In this blog entry, I will take you along a small OSINT investigation focused on the Russia-Ukraine conflict starting from the data collection, going past the verification process followed by the analysis of the findings and finally the report writing of the intelligence gathered. The title. Ideally, when you start an investigation, you should have a very clear idea of what you want to find out. It's much harder to find the answers when you don't have the questions. This could be something complex like are the mass graves in Busha a result of the attacks on civilians or a byproduct of the limited access to healthcare and emergency services in a war zone or something simple like how many churches were shelled in Mariupol in the month of April 2022. Sometimes you start with a question and will have to try to find the data needed to answer it and sometimes you come across the data and the question immediately pops up. Either way, for you to start an investigation, you need a clear and well-defined question. Whether that question comes before or after you have access to that data, that's up to the circumstances. The data. The Center for Information Resilience, alongside Bellingcat and GeoConfirmed, have been collecting, verifying and sharing geolocated data on Russian military activities in and around Ukraine on an online map entitled Russia-Ukraine Monitor Map since January 2022. As of December 2022, the map has been moved to eyesonrussia.org. As one among dozens of people involved in this massive project, it's both thrilling and daunting to see how much the database has grown in the past months. This impressive product is available for free to anyone who wants to see, interact with, or use it for their own intelligence reports. Please create our work though. Below on the left, you can see the first map used from January to December 2022 and on the right, the new map in use from December 2022 onwards. So this is the new one now. I have selected this public database as the data source for our little OSINT investigation as it's widely accessible, easily verifiable and I know how much sweat and tears was put into it. Definitely more tears and sweat in my case because I tend to work sitting down. So if we go to the map, this is what we would see below. There's a world map and at the center is Ukraine, where hundreds of markers point at the various geolocated data. So again, you can see how it was before and how it is now. All these markers are organized in several categories, such as civilian casualty, Russian firing positions, munitions, among many others. A box on the map contains information about the Russia-Ukraine monitor map, as well as some links. In the left image below, you can see again okay, how the old map used to include an item count, which is not present on the new map. At the time of writing, May 2022, there were almost 4,000 logged entries, all geolocated and verified by the team. The number grew exponentially by the time the new map, seen on the right, was introduced. On the old map, when you clicked on base map on the top right, you could change the style of the map. For this blog entry, I had selected to put it in pirate style because I like to amuse myself with little things in life. This option is no longer available on the new map, which is, in my humble opinion, a huge tragedy. I'm so upset by that. You can, however, select between the fold classic or earth style as seen highlighted in red on the right image below. Still not the same. I'm sorry, it's not the same. But now something interesting happened. Once I zoomed out enough, I realized that there's some peculiar markers across Russia, almost creating a line between Ukraine and the far east of Russia. Ukraine, 
far east of Russia, all the way to the shores of the Sea of Japan or East Sea. What could this be? And that is how I ended up with an idea for a small investigation for this blog. We'll be looking at these markers on the map and try to understand what was happening, when it happened, why it happened and what intelligence can we get from it. It won't be anything groundbreaking or worth a Pulitzer, but it will be a nice overview of how an OSINT investigation progresses from data to intelligence. On the left image, here you, go, you can see the markers on the old map versus the same markers on the new map on the right. When you click on one of the markers on the map, you can read more information about the geolocated incident. I started with the furthest marker from Ukraine in East Russia, not too far from China and North Korea. Once you click on it, you can see a preview of the data, a link to the source, that one, some brief description of the event there, and the coordinates, among many other details. And I can just show you how it looks like. So we have the map now, and we go there. It was, I believe, this one. So if you click on it, there you go. You have the video, so you can click the video, you can play the video. Underneath, you have the link, you have the coordinates, you have the description here, the town, etc. All the information. If you then keep checking the markers highlighted across Russia, you quickly realize that they're all showing similar content. So you have military vehicles transported in trains from around the same time, January and February 2022. So I'll show you again. Click. And you can click these markers. We like, what's that? Military equipment being loaded on trains in Eastern Russia. There you go. So next one. Movement of tanks. Again, trains moving military vehicle. Next one. Train moving heavy weaponry. So all of this seems to follow the same pattern. We're lucky that the amount of data for this specific investigation is fairly small and we can check every single entry quite quickly, but sometimes that is not the case. The Eyes on Russia map has a few options that we can use to filter the data. We can easily tell by clicking on the markers across Russia. They were all from events recorded between January and February 2022. We can therefore remove anything else from the map to clear up our view a bit. We can do this by using two different filter options. First, we narrow by location on the map and then we narrow by date. Below are the steps to narrow down by location. So you start by clicking the drawn map. So there's a symbol there. Then you select the rectangle option. There you go next to the number two circle. And then you click on the map to mark the first corner as we have here. So click there and you start dragging this rectangle. Afterwards, simply drag the cursor until you're happy with the borders of your search and select only events in map frame. So you tick that box there. So let me show you this in action. So you have the map here, right? You click draw on map, you have the rectangular just by default, and you click and you drag and there you go. So I'm happy with this rectangle with only events in map frame and you can still see it here. In fact, you can still see it here because this is dotted. So if you click inside, this line gets solid and suddenly everything here and everything here is just events inside of this rectangular that we selected. And this is very useful, so you don't have to worry about all the extra data. This is just this here. So off we go again. Afterwards, we'll narrow down our search to the desired date range, start to of January to end of February 2022. We can do this by either manually selecting the range on the left column, highlighted in red below, or by dragging the bar seen where the blue R is pointing until you reach the correct time frame. So if we reset the map and just start all over again, for example, just to show you how this works, you can just pick this up and you can change the date range. So you can see how this number is changing because it's the end. So it's moving and we can do the same as the start date. So you can move it and you can move it like this as well. Look at that. Amazing. Impressive. Off you go. We're only interested in the Russian military movements as that's the category of all the markers across Russia. So let's select the Russia military presence on the left 
bar. So again, I'll show you how this works. You have the categories, and if you just put Russian military presence, apply, suddenly that's all you see. Everything else is gone. Once you're done with all the filters, simply click inside the rectangular so it goes from a dashed line to a solid line, as I've shown you before. Afterwards, you'll be able to see that the list of events on the left bar and at the bottom now only contains those that fit the criteria. They are all between start of January and end of February 2022, and they are located within the selected area. If you click on any of the events on the left, you can quickly see the data, coordinates of the geolocation, and more details of the event. Now that we have access to all the relevant data, it's time to move to the next step in an OSINT investigation, the verification. Data is only good if we're able to verify it. As we already have the footage and the coordinates, we can quickly double check that they were correct before adding the data to our report. They're correct. I can assure you they're all correct. <laughs> Last thing we want to do is to build an entire investigation and draw conclusions around incorrect or misleading data. I selected the video previously shown from the very far east of Russia uploaded to Twitter on January 12, 2022, and quickly checked the area around Google Maps to confirm we have the correct geolocation. So these were the coordinates. On the left, we can see a frame of the video at the 41 second, and on the right, a photo I found on Google Maps of the train station in Spask Dalny, a town in Primorsky Krai. The blue building is a clear match, so this one could be green, I'm not sure. The photo was clearly taken between the big pole, this one, and the building, so more or less there. In fact, at the very beginning of the footage, we can see the pole and the fence both visible on the Google Maps photo on the right. As we don't have too much data to analyze, we can easily do this to every single piece of footage we plan on using. Once finished, we can move on to the next stage of an OSINT investigation, the analysis. Now it's time to answer the question, what intelligence can we get from all of this? At this point, we have answered the when, January and February 2022, the what, trains taking military Russian vehicles to the Ukrainian border, the why, preparing for an invasion. We're just missing the intelligence, so let's get some. We know that all our entries involve trains, so I searched for a map showing Russian train routes. I found a good one by simply searching Russian train routes on Google Images. I mean, <laughs> why make it hard, right? It depicts the different lines in various colors, so we could easily identify which route goes where. Afterwards, I placed a new image with 50% opacity on top of our data map to see if I could spot any interesting pattern. I have used the old pirate map because first pirates, and then second, the markers are bigger so you can see better. Unsurprisingly, we can see how the markers on the map match the Trans-Siberian Express route starting all the way at Vladivostok and going across the country before stopping at the border with Ukraine. So you can see the color here, Trans-Siberian Express is the red one, and you can easily see here's the route and goes through all of these markers. At some point, this line also connects with the Trans-Mongolian Express, although there's still two markers on the far east that can only match the Trans-Siberian route, nothing else. So we have Trans-Mongolian Express, it's this purple one, which goes down here, all the way to Beijing. And so this marker and this marker does not connect, so the only one that connects all of them is the Trans-Siberian Express. So now you must be thinking, so what? It's obvious that the Russian government will be using the Trans-Siberian Express route to move military vehicles from the Far East to the Ukrainian border. And you're right, it was an obvious choice, but that also means that it was predictable, and predictability in war is deadly. What could we possibly do with such information? We could do what I just did in five minutes. Now that we have the names of the cities from where the trains are passing through, we can search for live cameras pointing at the train tracks. Let me show you how fast it is. A quick Google search for railway cameras takes me to railwebcams.net, a website dedicated to railroad, trams, and station webcams worldwide. At the top of the website, I chose rail webcams by country and then selected Russia from the list. I am particularly interested in Vladivostok, the last or first station of the Trans-Siberian route at the very far east of Russia, just a few kilometers from the Chinese and North Korean border. 
Luckily for us, they have three webcams in that city, the first of which pointing at train tracks. Aren't we lucky? If we click on the cam one, you'll be able to have a very clear view of the tracks, live and available 24 hours a day. Below is a screenshot I took when I visited the link and I can show you how it looks now. So same place, have here the website, you click rail webcams by country, as I've said, you find Russia, which is maybe out of sight, but I'll drag it. So where's it gone? Okay, okay, Russia. And then we're just going to start typing Vladivostok, make it fast. And here we are, cam number one. Let me see the camera. And here it is. This is the same train tracks that I have screenshot many months ago. Today, the 15th January 2023. In Russia, at least, it's still the 14th January where I am. And here it is, full of snow now. That was easy. Back again. So, as a precaution, I checked that this webcam is pointing at the train tracks in Vladivostok and not a different location, incorrectly labeled, because you always have to verify everything. Below is a screenshot I took from a Google Street View image at the following coordinates in Vladivostok. There you go. You can see the same street lamp, the same building on the left of the tracks, the same benches and the same patterned floor. It's clearly the same location. If you use the coordinates and check Google Maps, you can turn around and you can see the bridge as well. So let's check it out. We have the train tracks, you have the building here, you have the benches. You can, let's play that. You cannot see the patterned floor because snow, but you can see the bridge there as well. As this is an example of an OSINT investigation and I don't want to end up with enough information to write a book, the analysis stage will have to be hypothetical. Let's imagine that this was happening in February 2022 and you were doing everything I did so far. You could, for example, compile a decent list of similar webcams, all pointing at places where Russian military vehicles were seen being transported in trains en route to Ukraine, record them and then analyze the content. Perhaps gathering what sort of vehicles were being taken and where, this sort of data before invasion would have been very exciting and useful to have and analyze. The interesting thing is that, as we have seen, this geolocated footage was available at the time. All of this, all of it, was uploaded and geolocated in January and February before the invasion. It was all available. Anyone, literally anyone with an internet connection could have gathered, analyzed and written a very useful report on it. Perhaps someone did. You could end up with a very detailed list of exactly what tank models were being sent where, how many trucks were going to a specific town, how many refuel trucks accompany each battalion, what rocket launcher models the Russians have and where they were deployed. Perhaps you could even check satellite imagery of certain areas around specific cities. Imagine that you were following a train route and suddenly there's vehicles that you hadn't seen before en route. They weren't there in city A, but suddenly they were when they went past city B. Now you have a very good range of places to search to see if you could spot where they were kept. You could even keep track of the number of vehicles taken over time by periodically checking the satellite images of the area. I can quickly show how easy it is. Let's jump on the map again and see if we can spot any trains near Vladivostok, clearly my newest favorite city in East Russia. Below you can see how there is indeed a video of military vehicles being loaded onto trains on March 2nd, 2022 in Khabarovsk Krai province where Vladivostok is located, so this one here. And because everything on this map is geolocated, we can just grab the coordinates, these are the coordinates, so this one's same as this one, so I'll just copy now. Put them on a map and check the surroundings. We know that the vehicles were being loaded, so they were probably near the trucks. Within a few seconds, we can spot a military base on Google Maps as seen below. The arrow shows the train tracks, so there we go. The orange circle, the corners, and the dark blue rectangle, the military base. Remember how I copied the coordinates? So let's grab our Google Earth, because I love Google Earth. Drop the coordinates there. And off we go, around, around the map, all the way to East Russia. So this 
was where we spotted the military vehicles being loaded onto the trains. And if we just move along, look at that. Military vehicles, all of them, just the military base. Brilliant. Zooming a bit more allows us to check out some of the Russian military vehicles in more detail. So look at that. It's quite interesting, isn't it? A lot less now. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> you can now start tracking this section using free or paid satellite tools depending on the level of detail you're looking for. The available OSINT investigations using data from Eisen Russia map are endless and only limited by your own imagination. We are certainly not lacking in data. And before we move on, I want to show you something. I have just explained how you can find and analyze the data on the map for your own investigations. But sometimes the interesting bit is not the location of the data on the map, but rather where there is no data. And what do I mean by this? A few months ago, I was investigating the damage to educational facilities in Kharkiv, Ukraine by Russian missiles. This is my final report that I will link in the description. So this is just a section of it, obviously not my full report. I wrote way more than just two pictures. <laughs> As I mapped the overall strikes in Kharkiv here on the right versus the strikes that hit educational facilities, so universities, schools, nurseries, etc. I realized that there were a lot of empty areas. You can see on a map how many of the areas surrounding the educational facilities had absolutely no hits at all since the beginning of the invasion. So this map shows all the areas that were hit in Kharkiv between February and July when I wrote the report and this shows only the educational facilities and what we see here. A lot of these areas have absolutely no hits at all nearby. Nothing else was hit apart from the educational facilities. This to me is evidence that the direct target of these missiles was the educational buildings. They were not a byproduct of indiscriminate shelling, they were the target. The Russian military has been directly targeting education facilities in Kharkiv, perhaps other places as well, obviously, since the beginning of the war. And this is the sort of stuff you can easily do with the data on the map or with the absence of the data on the map. Moving on, the report. Once you're done with the analysis of your data, it's time to write a nice report on your findings. What was your conclusion? How did you reach it? What data did you use? How did you verify it? Why should we trust it? All of these are questions that need answering. An OSINT investigation should be transparent. You are there to look at the facts, verify, analyze, and report your findings. The report stage might be the most important of them all. You might have discovered something absolutely groundbreaking, and even better, you have undeniable proof of your claims. But if you're not able to explain your process and adapt your knowledge to your audience, all that work was for nothing. What is your audience interested in and how much detail do they want? Will they be able to understand what you're trying to convey? Does it matter to them? Why should they listen to what you have to say? When writing a report, I would always advise to throw in some nice maps, graphics, screenshots, videos, whatever other visual aids you can get. It helps people understand what you're trying to explain and makes it easier to digest if the content is too complex. The majority of the population will not be as well versed in open source intelligence as you are, so it's your job to make the knowledge attainable. Conclusion. OSINT investigation is an exciting field of work. It takes work, a lot of attention to details and a fair amount of persistence to not only get the intelligence behind the data, but to also be able to explain and share it with others. I hope my little, it was definitely not little, <laughs> tutorial gave you inspiration for investigation, the tools to collect the data and the motivation to just go for it. Thank you for listening. Sophia.